Well, God bless you and good evening to all of you tonight. Can we clap our hands and bless the Lord for being here at our weekly Bible study? Truly, it is a blessing once again to be back in the house of the Lord. And uh, we are grateful for all of you that are here with us tonight. Uh, even those of you that are watching through our Facebook uh, live stream, we appreciate you joining us and taking time out of your schedules to be with us uh, tonight in our Bible study. We're going to get right into the word if that is okay with you. Uh, so I'm going to invite your attention to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, we trust that all of you are having an amazing uh, week uh, thus far and that the Lord is uh, doing some uh, mighty things in your midst. Uh, if that is not the case, just hold on and uh, continue to be faithful and just trust that God is uh, going to come through for you because he is a God who cannot lie. But we are blessed again to have this opportunity to get into the word of God with all of you. I don't want to take up too much of the time tonight. I want to share just a few things uh, out of the word of God. For those of you that have been joining us for the past few weeks, we've been talking about uh, relationships. I was uh, just sharing a message this past Sunday about relationships and uh, the Sunday prior to that, and I'll, I'll probably be sharing another message this coming Sunday, and, uh, and we'll talk more about love and, and uh, the 90 Day Love Challenge on the 28th of this month as well. But tonight I wanna deviate just a little bit from relationships because uh, as I just stated, we'll get more into that uh, this coming Sunday. But as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to talk from the subject, and it's just one word, but I want to talk about it a little bit tonight because as we are engaging in relationships with each other and as we are going about our daily routines and as we are going about having church and church services and all that uh, comes along with that, and as you just go about living your life in a general sense, one of the things that we cannot uh, forget about is that in the midst of everything that we are attempting to do in terms of living our lives and interacting with other people and establishing the kingdom of God and just going about doing the things that God has called us to do, we cannot uh, forget about the fact that there's always spiritual warfare. There's always spiritual warfare that uh, is on the scene. And, uh, and I just want to uh, just kind of make you aware of that again tonight. So my subject tonight is warfare. I just want to talk about warfare uh, because it's a very real thing, uh, particularly when you are moving forward in the things that God is calling you to do when you sense and can discern uh, that you're on the verge of a breakthrough or when you sense that there is some sense of progress that you're making in your life. I want you to understand clearly the enemy does not like that. In fact, the enemy hates it. Uh, he does not want to see you and I achieve uh, the things that God has placed in our hearts to do and to achieve. Uh, and that's why we have an enemy in this life. And, uh, and that's why we have to understand the dynamics of spiritual warfare. Now in the book of Ephesians chapter six, we're not gonna go there tonight, but the Apostle Paul talks more in depth about uh, spiritual warfare when he says, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Mm -hmm. Now he uses the word wiles in, uh, in Ephesians chapter six, but that word wiles, W-I-L-E-S, translates into methods. Or it can also translate into the word uh, schemes. Uh, and so we understand that, that when the enemy is at work, uh, he works against you and I uh, through the form of schemes and methods. Uh, that the enemy doesn't just attack any of us or our families or our church or our community just in a kind of a casual sort of way. When the enemy comes against you, he comes against you with methods. He comes against you with strategies. It's a well thought out process. Does that make sense? And that's something that we have to understand on a spiritual level that when you come up under attack, uh, sometimes you may be caught off guard 
but the enemy was planning and, str and strategizing behind the scenes all the time. And sometimes uh, when you are attacked, it can uh, cause you to feel as though what has happened to me? What, why do I feel this way? What is going on in my life? I didn't see this coming. And oftentimes it's because the enemy was strategizing behind the scenes with his cohorts, other satanic, other demonic spirits to conspire against you so that you would not continue to move in forward progress in the things of God and all that he has for your life. So we want to get into this a little bit tonight. I'm, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I just want to, again, just make you aware that as you keep pressing, that as you keep praying, that as you keep seeking the Lord, as you keep standing in great expectation, just be aware of the fact that there's always some kind of warfare that is uh, lingering in the realm of the spirit. Because sometimes you can, you can be uh, convinced that, you know, the sun is shining every day and then all of a sudden something breaks loose against you. All of a sudden uh, some attack begins to arise in your circumstances and in your situations. And so what I'm simply trying to say is that as we continue to go about the business of our Heavenly Father, we cannot forget the fact that warfare uh, is still something that we have to contend with. Mm -hmm. Now, what I want to do is to read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1 through verse number 6. So if you have it, say, I have it. Yeah. I'm going to begin reading this at verse number 1. I'm reading from the King James Version tonight. Uh, Paul says in verse 1, Now I, Paul, myself beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now, just for the sake of, uh, of having more clarity in terms of its reading, let me read uh, these same verses of Scripture from the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation. And so again, I'll read verse 1 uh, down to verse number 6 just for clarity's sake. Now, verse number 1 in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 from the New Living Translation says this, Now I, Paul appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ, though I realize you think I am timid in person and bold only when I write from far away. Well, I am begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. We are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And after you have become fully obedient, we will punish everyone who remains disobedient. Now, this sounds like some very interesting uh, things that Paul is writing here, but let me just give you kind of a backdrop as to why he is writing this way and why he is saying some of the things that he is saying, uh, because it, it sounds like Paul is trying to straighten out some issues uh, within the Corinthian church, and to be quite honest with you, he really is, uh, because there were some issues within the Corinthian church, and at this particular uh, stage uh, or phase in Paul's 
dealing with the Corinthian church, uh, he wants to try to bring more clarity into the lives of the Corinthian believers so that they can kind of get back to understanding who Christ is. Now, one of the issues that uh, began to arise at this particular time within the Corinthian church is that you had many false apostles uh, that were rising up. And uh, you had many individuals that were penetrating and infiltrating uh, the church at Corinth, if you will, uh, that were kind of leading the church astray. They were influencing the hearts and the minds of the people at this particular time, and they were preaching false doctrine. They were bringing about different philosophical uh, ideas and concepts that were contrary to the teachings of Jesus and uh, contrary to the doctrines of Christ. And so Paul, uh, being the founder of the church at Corinth, uh, took the responsibility of writing to the Corinthian church so that he could help them to understand uh, the doctrines of Christ and to bring them into the knowledge of spiritual warfare because they were coming up under attack in their spirits and in their minds. Uh, there was a spirit of deception that was on the loose and the enemy was trying to create chaos and division and confusion in the lives of the believers because that's one of the greatest weapons that the enemy uses against the church and against you. And that is to bring about confusion and chaos. This is why Paul in another setting of scripture said that God is not the author, the author of confusion, but of peace. And so when we begin to understand that there's confusion or division, we can always point to the fact that there could be an enemy, a spirit uh, that is on the loose, that is uh, trying to infiltrate the atmosphere. And that's what Paul is dealing with here, that the Corinthian church was being influenced by other voices. Does that make sense? And I, I bring that to your attention because you have to pay attention to the voices around you. The voices that come to your heart, the voices that come to your mind, the voices that come to your spirit. And these voices can come to you in, in several different ways. Like it doesn't just have to be uh, a, a spirit that is sending suggestions and that sort of thing, even though that is a part of it, that is a part of it, that, that spirits, demonic spirits will, will speak things to you will whisper certain suggestions and certain words into your heart and, and try to cause you to uh, agree with what is being spoken so that you will fall prey to the influence of the demonic realm. And then sometimes voices can come uh, through other people outside of you. And sometimes voices can come through uh, your own head and your own spirit uh, if it is not in sync with the Holy Spirit. Am I making sense? But nevertheless, what Paul is, is trying to help the Corinthian church to understand is that, again, there is warfare that we deal with uh, as believers because we are not on the devil's side. We are on the Lord's side. And you become a direct foe of the adversary. Does that make sense? And so, again, you want to pay attention to voices, uh, to influences that comes into your life who or what influences your life. You have to pay attention to that because sometimes you can be on the straight and narrow. Sometimes you can be walking in obedience. Sometimes you can be doing that which God has called for you to do. And all of a sudden, some other voice will come out of nowhere. And again, sometimes it could just be a spirit. Sometimes it could be a person. Sometimes it could be you. And so you have to watch these areas in your life so that you can stay in alignment with the word and the kingdom of God uh, so that your purpose uh, can be fulfilled. But again, Paul is having to deal with these issues in the Corinthian church because uh, it was his responsibility as their spiritual father to protect them as best as he could uh, from the enemy. And so he's writing this letter uh, to help them to realize that they have been influenced, that they are up under deception uh, from false apostles and false uh, teachers uh, that are uh, releasing things into the atmosphere that has not been ordered by the Lord. 
Now, I want to say this. Everything that sounds good does not mean that it comes from God. Everything that has uh, some philosophical idea attached to it does not always mean that it's grounded in truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every good idea that sounds like a good idea may not be a God idea. And we have to understand that every idea, every good idea may not always be a God idea because you have to check whether or not that idea or those thoughts or those concepts are supported by scripture. Does that make sense? Is it supported by the word? Now, I know we live in a culture today where people don't really study the word like we should. We don't really read the Bible. So we just live our lives off of a few quotes on Facebook or Twitter. And I've said many, many times that is not enough. That is not enough to just get one thought per day. That's not going to be enough because one thought doesn't tell you the full story. It doesn't give you the full thought. If, if I just tell you one sentence of what I'm thinking, uh, that doesn't suggest that I have given you the full crux of what I was actually processing. Does that make sense? And I would rather have the full story just uh, instead of just having, you know, just a few droplets here and there because that's not going to be enough to sustain you when you are dealing with spiritual warfare. Am I right? And so, again, this is what Paul is helping them to realize and to understand that, that he wants them to come into the reality that they have uh, been up under attack in a spiritual way and that the devil is using individuals uh, to plant seeds and to release uh, teachings and understandings in their lives that have not been supported by the Spirit of God. The other thing that is happening in this particular case and in this situation is that there has been some talk about the Apostle Paul. Uh, because again, Paul is the founder of this church. He gave birth to the Corinthian church. And, uh, and again, he saw fit that it was his responsibility to deal with these issues. He wasn't there in person, but what he decided to do was to write a letter to them. And this is why we have 1st and 2nd Corinthians. These are letters that Paul has written to the Corinthian church because Paul is going about the business of spreading the gospel. He's, he's a true apostle. He's in other regions, in other territories, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. But one of the other issues that comes up is that they are attacking Paul, that, that Paul is coming up under attack through these false apostles, through uh, these other voices, and, uh, and even the Corinthian uh, church itself. Some of the believers in the Corinthian church, they began to question Paul's uh, authority as a true apostle, believe that or not. I mean, think about it. He gave birth to the church. He founded the church. Uh, many of them came into the knowledge of Christ, not many of them, all of them, came into the knowledge of Jesus Christ through the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And then later, they question whether or not he is even a legitimate apostle. Now, just imagine that. They, this is the warfare that is going on because one of the things that the enemy will always try to do is turn you against the one that God sent to bless you. He will always try to turn you and deceive you and, and, and plant certain seeds. Are you listening to me? To try to detour you from the very voice that God is raising to speak into your heart and speak into your spirit, the word of life. And so they are questioning Paul's uh, authority as an apostle. And, and they're actually, you know, saying some things about him that aren't true. And one of the things they, they are suggesting is that maybe Paul, when he's writing his letters, that he, he writes in sort of a firm sort of way. But then when he's present with them, that uh, he's not as strong. And Paul is wanting them to realize that uh, this is not his motive at all, that he is not trying to be uh, two ways with them, that he's not trying to speak in a firm way only when he's away, but he's only trying to instruct them in the ways of the Lord. Now look at verse 1. It says, Now I, Paul, appeal to you with the gentleness and kindness of Christ, though I realize you think I am timid in person and bold only when I write 
from far away. So this, this is uh, the issue that's going on. They think that he is timid in person, but then he's strong in his writings. And, and Paul is clearing this up. In verse 2, he says, well, I am begging you now so that when I come, I won't have to be bold with those who think we act from human motives. <laughs> and, and I just love what he's saying here. He's, he's saying, one, I'm coming to you in gentleness and kindness. And this is the true heart of a leader a true heart of an apostle. He, he knows that they have been influenced by other people. And Paul is saying, first and foremost, I'm coming to you in a gentle spirit. I'm not angry with you. I'm not upset with you because he knows the deal. He knows what's going on with them. And, uh, and he wants them to understand that my motive concerning your lives and concerning my writings are not coming from a fleshly uh, motive or fleshly attitude, but I am writing this, this, this letter to you from a godly perspective because, again, he has the discernment as to what is going on with the Corinthian church. Now, notice in verse number three, he says, we are human, but we do not wage war as humans do. We are human, but we do not wage war as humans do because he's not talking about a worldly physical war. He's not talking about like the war between Ukraine and Russia where you've got army tanks and military uh, weapons and that sort of thing. He says that's not the kind of warfare that I'm referring to, although that physical war and warfare that we see in the physical world is nothing but a natural picture of what is actually going on in a spiritual sense. Does that make sense? You see now the issue that's going on between Israel and Iran. Uh, what you see is you see uh, weapons being released against another country and people die and people, you know, uh, get killed in those kind of situations. And, and as you see that in the natural, I believe God wants us to understand that that same sort of thing can happen in the realm of the spirit because during spiritual warfare, just like worldly secular warfare, you will always have casualties. You will always have casualties. Somebody will get hurt. Someone will uh, fall by the wayside. Someone will just be pulled completely out of the fight because they are not ready to engage in spiritual warfare. They may not have their, their, uh, their war clothes on. They may not have on the full armor of God that they might be able to withstand against the enemy and the attacks that come against them. And the enemy can come in and sift you as wheat. But we don't want that to happen to you. We don't want that to happen to anyone in this church, anyone watching. That's why I believe that the Lord is allowing this word to go out tonight. Now, let me remind you again, the issue is, is that false voices have come in. And the issue is, is that these voices are trying to turn. They're trying to turn the Corinthian believers against the Apostle Paul, who again gave birth to their lives in a spiritual sense and helped them to come into the knowledge of God. And Paul now is talking about warfare. He's talking about warfare, but he's not talking about it uh, in a physical sense. He's talking about it in a spiritual sense. What I'm trying to say to you is that you are fighting forces you cannot see that this fight is an invisible fight. It's an invisible fight. In the old covenant, you could see your enemy. When the Israelites would fight against the Philistines, as it were, you could see your enemy. You could see the spear. You could see the swords. You, you could see uh, the, the, the full uh, artillery that they would use against you. You could see the, the clothing that they would wear, the shield and the helmets and all of this. You could physically see your enemy. They would be standing there in front of you. But then in the New Testament, the warfare turns from a physical fight to a spiritual fight. And so you are dealing with enemies that your physical eyes cannot see. And sometimes you can come up under attack and not even know it. Sometimes your mind and your emotions and your heart can come up under attack and you think it's some physical thing when it could be some invisible thing that is attacking you on a daily basis. 
It could be witchcraft. It could be some kind of demonic force that is trying to infiltrate your way of thinking and seeing and believing to detour you from what God wants for your life. And that's why Paul is trying to arrest their attention and bring them into the mind of God to understand that you are in the midst of warfare. That there are other entities and uh, other persons that are trying to infiltrate your mind and belief system to pull you away from me and from the kingdom. That's what he wanted them to understand. And so in verse number four, he says, we use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. In the King James Version, uh, that particular uh, scripture says, let me pull it up in the King James. In the King James, it says in verse number four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what is he saying here? He wants them to understand again that we are engaging in spiritual warfare. It's an invisible fight. You cannot see the devil. You cannot see uh, spirit beings that are attacking you. And that's why you need to be in tune to the Holy Spirit. Be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because if you don't have your war clothes on, the enemy can easily come in and deceive you while you're speaking in tongues. He can come in and deceive you while you're sitting in church. He can come in and deceive you while you're uh, doing spiritual things. But if you don't understand that warfare is on the loose, uh, spirits can come in and attack your mind and your emotions and have you off and not even know it. And so Paul says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God. And what I, what I like that he's teaching here is that he wants the Corinthian believers to understand that even though we are engaging in spiritual warfare, we have weapons of our own. <laughs> that we have weapons as believers, that we have something to fight back with, that we are not useless, that we are not powerless. That, that the enemy uh, doesn't have the authority, no, nor does he have the right to just come into your life and do whatever he wants to do and you not have anything at your disposal to resist him with. What Paul is saying, uh, our warfare is not carnal. We, we fight through the mighty weapons of God. Yes, yes. That God has given us weapons to, to stand He's given us weapons to uh, fight the demonic attacks and fight the demonic voices that come against your mind and your spirit, to fight against depression, to fight against anxiety, to fight against thinking that is not in alignment with the word of God. God is saying, I have given you weapons to do something about this. Does that make sense? You have something that you can fight back with. And that's why we need what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6. When he told us to put on the whole armor of God, that you might be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he goes on to describe the, the armor that we have at our disposal. Remember, he talks about putting on the helmet of salvation and taking up the shield of faith and, and the sword of the spirit and, and the belt of truth and girding up your loins and that sort of thing and shodding your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He's describing the different weapons, spiritual weapons, that God has given to us to overthrow the enemy that's trying to overthrow us. Does that make sense? So what you have to understand is that you don't have to take it. You don't have to just take whatever the enemy says. You don't have to take whatever he tries to do against you. You don't have to just surrender as if you are hopeless. You don't have to succumb to the tactics of the enemy. God wants you and I to understand that we have weapons that he has given to us that we might overthrow the demonic, dark, and wicked forces that come against our lives. Does that make sense? And so I want you to understand that you have something that you can fight back with, but you've got to know what your weapons are. You've got to know what your weapons are because you can have access to weapons, but if you don't know how to use them 
and if you don't exercise them, see, you can have power, but if you don't know how the power works, you can have authority, but if you don't work your authority, then the enemy could still take advantage over you, even though you have everything at your disposal to get the victory. Does that make sense? You could have something to, to defeat what has come against you, but if you don't know how to use it, if you don't know how to work it, then, then you could come down when you could stay up. You, you, you could come into a state of depression when, when God could be giving you joy if you only knew how to work the weapons that he has given unto you. And this is why Paul is saying the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That we're not fighting the enemy and dark forces with guns and knives. He's saying this is spiritual warfare and the only way for you to get the victory is to fight back with spiritual weapons. Spiritual weapons even like prayer. Does that make sense? And that's what I want to share tonight. Prayer is not just for having communion with the Lord, although that's a very vital uh, part of prayer. It's having communion with the Lord, hearing the voice of God in your spirit and that kind of thing. You having a dialogue with him. All of that is important. But prayer uh, is also used as a weapon. It is also used as a weapon. And what you have to do is turn your prayer from a communing kind of prayer into what I call a warfare prayer where you begin to speak against the enemy, where you begin to speak the word of God against the enemy, where you declare and decree that no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Where you begin to declare and decree that I am the head and not the tail. Where you begin to speak the word of God that Satan you have already been defeated by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I stand in victory. You have to speak that out of your mouth. Whatever is rising against you, whatever is speaking to you, whatever is trying to detour you from what God has for you, you want to turn your prayer into this cute, nice prayer, into a warfare kind of prayer, and begin to use the word that God has given to you to slay the devils that are rising up against your house, rising up against your joy, rising up against your peace. Because some of the stuff that you're experiencing, it's not just because you didn't sleep well last night. It's not because you didn't have eight hours of sleep. It's not always because you didn't eat lunch. Sometimes your spirit, man, sometimes your life is going through things because there are invisible forces that are trying to drag you down and trying to pull you away from the promises that God has for your life. And I came tonight to tell you, you have to resist the enemy and put up your guard against him and stand in faith and refuse to allow any demonic power to bring you down. Are you listening to me? And I want you to look at your neighbor tonight and just tell them, I need you to fight back. Yeah, I need you to fight back. I, I need you to fight back. I need you to fight. I know I've got some fighters in here. I know there are some fighters watching me online. I know you can go off, but you've got to learn how to go off in a spiritual sense. You've got to learn how to take that anger and use it against the enemy. You've got to take that stubbornness and, and work it the right way. Don't use it against your purpose and your promise. You want to use it to your advantage against the enemy. You ought to develop stubbornness tonight and declare to all of hell, you will not bring me down. You will not take me out. You will not pull me away from my calling. You will not destroy my purpose. You will not destroy my way of thinking. You will not cause me to think that I am nothing. You ought to speak back. You ought to use the weapons that God has given to you. And you'll realize that the enemy is more worried about you than you should be of him. But you've got to have a clear understanding of what you're up against because it's an invisible fight. It's an invisible fight. Now, notice what Paul says. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 
I love how he uses the word strongholds because what he is trying to point to now is that you're being attacked in your mind. You're being attacked in your emotions. Come on, I need you to hear me tonight. You're being attacked. Oh God, I feel this tonight. You're being attacked in your mind, in your emotions, in your thought life. And what Paul is saying is that we have weapons to fight against the strongholds of the enemy. Now, let me talk about strongholds. When you talk about strongholds, you're talking about a fortified place. You're talking about a fortified place. This, this is where uh, other voices begin to infiltrate your mind. And, and if you don't deal with those voices and those foreign thoughts that are not in alignment with God, the enemy will plant those thoughts in you and cause you to believe something that's not even real. He will cause you to believe something that's not even true. And it becomes a stronghold when that thought starts dwelling in you. And that's what they want, the demonic realm. That's what Satan wants is to plant suggestions in you and thoughts in you that you hold on to them rather than fighting them and releasing them. He wants you to hold on to them so that they become a stronghold. And what I mean again by that is the thought becomes a, a, fortify, a fortified place inside of you and it begins to infiltrate your personality and you begin to think a certain way that is contrary to the ways of God. Does that make sense? And so you don't ever want there to be strongholds that set up in your mind. It's a thought process that's holding you strong. Do you hear what I'm saying? Is, is that clear? It's holding you strong. What that means is that it's, it's there and it doesn't want to let you go. It wants you to believe a lie. It wants you to believe something that is not true, something that is not of the Lord, and it, it wants to stay. And that's why it becomes a stronghold. And when the enemy sees that, you can't see this in the realm of the spirit, but I want to describe it to you. When that thought gets in you and it starts resonating inside of you and it's not of God, the devil will assign demons to come alongside of you to protect that area in your life, to make sure you stay in a prison to make, make sure you stay in the realm of lies, to make sure you stay in the realm of spiritual ignorance where you are not uh, uh, in a place to understand the truth of what is really going on in your life. And so demons will come alongside of you in the realm of the spirit and they will feed the thought. They will feed it, they will protect it, it will become a fortified place inside of you and it's a stronghold. It's a stronghold, and these are the dynamics of spiritual warfare. Because listen to me, the enemy doesn't have to control your money to control your life. What he has to do is to control your mind. If he can control your mind and control how you're thinking and how you're processing, he will control and manipulate everything around you. And that's why no matter what you do, you have to always protect your mind, protect, protect your thinking. You should always be thinking about what you're thinking about. You should always examine your thoughts. Are these my thoughts or are these enemies and thoughts that have come from foreign territory that should not even be living in my head? Are you listening to me? Am I being arrested by demonic forces and other people that are saying things that are not in alignment or in agreement with the word of God? And these thoughts are trying to come in and arrest me and to bring me into captivity. And if that is the case, I am here again tonight to announce to you that you have weapons to break the stronghold to break the stronghold, to rise up against it, to get a new thought, to get new ideas, uh, to, to come against the thing that has come against your emotions because the enemy wants you to think that you're about to die 
Are y'all listening to me? He wants you to think that you're not going to come out of your situation. He wants you to think that you're going under. He wants you to think that there's no hope at all. He wants you to think that you could never be free, that you could never uh, be what God is saying about your life. These are strongholds, and God is sending his anointing tonight to destroy the yoke. To destroy the yoke. To break the stronghold over your mind. And you ought to just receive that right now. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You're not going to bring me into a realm of suicidal thoughts. and You're not going to bring me into a place of where I hate myself. You're, you're not going to convince me that I'm not a child of God. The devil is a liar. Are you listening to me? You're not going to make me think that I've come this far and now God's about to pull me out of the game. It's a stronghold. It's a stronghold. It's thoughts. It's feelings. Oh God, are you listening to me? It's a fortified place, but we're about to tear it down. <laughs> Woo, somebody hear me tonight. We're about to tear it down. We're about to tear the gates down. We're about to tear that fence down. We're about to break the curse over your emotions right now in the name of Jesus because God has a greater place that he's calling you into and you cannot afford to be down right now. You cannot afford to be depressed right now. You cannot afford to be in doubt right now. You cannot afford to be vacillating and being torn betwixt and between two precarious positions where you're in a spiritual quagmire. God wants to deliver you you. God wants to bring you out of two minds, two ways of thinking. God wants to break the chain of apostolic, false apostolic influence, false teachings, false doctrines, false ideologies. God wants to break it off of you right now. You can't just have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and just a smorgasbord of all kind of beliefs. You've got to understand that Jesus is the rock. My God, are y'all listening to me? Jesus is the rock. Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. And so Paul says that we have weapons that are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Listen at verse number five, and casting down imaginations. Imaginations, can you hear this? He's still talking about your mind. Your mind, your imagination. He's saying, casting down imaginations. You've got, you've got images in your head that are not influenced by the Spirit of God. And that's really what fear does. It shows, you, it shows you negative pictures. It shows you images of failure. And, and the enemy will torment your mind and your emotions in thinking that, that nothing but negative things are going to come into your life. And sometimes none of that stuff ever happens. You notice that? You, have you ever been worried about something and, and thinking that this is how it's going to turn out and you give it a few days or a few weeks and you realize that none of the stuff you thought was going to happen, that it didn't happen at all. But what the enemy wants is for you to be nervous and for you to be worried and to develop ulcers in your stomach and, and, and all kind of diseases to break out in your body. And so he knows that he doesn't have the power to change your destiny, but he wants you to think it's not going to happen. He wants you to think what God has said is not going to come forth. Am I helping anybody tonight? And so Paul says, casting down imagination. Tell somebody we've got to bring it down. God, hallelujah. Glory to God. We have to cast it down. Cast it down. He ain't playing. Paul says, cast it down. Cast down imaginations, images, and pictures that are showing you death and showing you in chaos and showing you broke and showing you not having what you need and showing you pictures of unhappiness. God is saying tonight, I want you to take all of those images in your head and in your spirit and cast it down. Cast it down. Cast it down, casting down imaginations, 
casting down imaginations, thoughts that are just coming up inside of you and mental images and pictures are being painted on the canvas of your mind. And Paul is saying this is where the warfare is, but keep in mind again, we have weapons to deal with that. So you have to understand that, that the enemy again works to control the mind. It's the control center. It's the control center. If I can infiltrate your mind, I can govern your life. I can tell you who you are. I can tell you who you're not. If I can get into your mind, into your control system. He says, casting down imagination. Now check this one out. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. He says, we're going to deal with the images in your mind. Images and pictures of, of lack and devastation. He says, we're going to cast all that down. We're going to defeat that in the name of Jesus. God, I just feel like somebody's being helped right now. I just felt a release in the spirit that God is casting down the imaginations of your mind that have been influenced by satanic voices. By satanic voices. I don't know who I'm ministering to tonight, but I hear the Lord say, you're going to make it. You are going to make it. You are going to experience good success. You are going to receive your breakthrough. That promise is already in the atmosphere. Your deliverance is already on the horizon. And anything and everything that is speaking contrary in your mind God says, I want you to cast it down. Yes. Are you hearing what I'm saying? How do you cast it down? I was just telling you, you speak it. You speak to that dark image and say to it, get out of my mind. Get out of my thought. This is not going to happen. I cancel it. I cancel it. I cancel it in the name of Jesus. So he says, casting down imaginations. And then he said, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Now notice the fight is against the knowledge of God. Because remember I was sharing with you earlier, false apostles had come into the Corinthian church. And they were spewing false teachings and doctrines. And these teachings were trying to exalt themselves above the word of God. And so Paul says, so everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, it's against God's knowledge. Do you hear what I'm saying? Anything that is trying to infiltrate your soul that is fighting the knowledge of God, he's saying you got to cast it down. Anything that is talking to you or speaking to you, my God, are y'all hearing this? Anything that is trying to influence your way of living that contradicts the knowledge of God, God is saying you got to get rid of that thought. You got to shut that voice down. You got to come away from that false teaching. Come away from that doctrine. Stop letting that information feed your spirit. Because all it will do is bring confusion. It will bring confusion. And what the enemy wants to do is to use it to slowly but surely cause you to doubt who God is. Or to make you think that Jesus isn't enough. Or to cause you to look at the kingdom of God in a very uh, dark sort of way. Because you are being influenced by the wrong thing. And so he says, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. And then he says, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So, so the standard is the word of God. The word of God. Why do we say that? Because the word of God is God's truth. Everything else is a lie. Everything else is contradictory to the word of God. We have to bring it down, bring it under subjection. If, if there's no agreement that you're listening to or observing that is not in the flow of the scriptures, God is saying you got to bring that down, even if it's your own thoughts. Even if your own thoughts are speaking things 
to your spirit, to your being that's not in support of what God has said in his word, you've got to bring that down. Does that make sense? I've got to bring that down, even if you like the thought, even if you love how you feel. <laughs> If it's not in sync with the word, if it's not in sync with the word, I've got to bring it down because you've heard me say for years, your worst enemy is the enemy within you. It's your own mind. It's your own thoughts, your own feelings and emotions can deceive you more than people. Are you listening to me? And so even if you have your own thoughts that are coming up and they will, they will come up and say, God didn't really mean that. God is okay with me uh, doing this or acting this way. And so, see, your human mind likes to do human reasoning. Are y'all listening to it? It will talk you out of the will of God. That's why Paul said that your flesh man can never submit itself to the spirit of, the spirit of God. To be carnally minded is death. That's what he said in Romans chapter 8. For to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Yeah. To be fleshly is to walk in death, to walk in darkness, to walk according to the deceptive forces of your flesh. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because you're walking according to the truth of God's word. You're walking in the light of his wisdom and of his knowledge and of his understanding. And so Paul says, when you have thoughts or ideas or concepts or doctrines or teachings that are standing up against the word of God and you've elevated them in your soul, he says, you've got to bring them down and put them right back in their rightful place. Underneath you. Does that make sense? Underneath you. Because I see it all the time that people are excited about things that aren't even true. They believe things that aren't even grounded in truth, God's truth. And you can spend 20, 30, 50, 60 years living a lie and not even know it. And, and it's been exhausted, or not exhausted, but exalted in your thinking, in your heart. And God is saying, I believe he's saying it right now, that I want to deal with that and bring that down. I want to bring those idols down. I want to bring that way of thinking down. I want to crush it, get rid of it so that you can see the light and come into the essence of what God is wanting to speak into your spirit and into your soul so that you can enjoy what God is ready to do in your life. So he says everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity to the obedience of Christ. This is amazing. And again, notice the warfare is in your mind. It's in your mind. It's in your imagination. It's in your thought process. And some of that stuff has become strongholds. God is saying through the apostle Paul that the warfare is in your mind. And what I need you to do is to get the truth of my word. And whatever has infiltrated your mind and is serving as a higher thought above God's word, I want you to take the word of God and go against that thought. And bring it down. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is how you do it literally. You take the word of God and let that word minister to you. And you get the revelation of that word. And you get the mind of God on it. And you take that word and, 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 and war with it against what's already going on in your head. And you bring that thought under subjection to what God revealed to you from his word. I just showed you how to renew your mind. Yeah. Notice Paul says in Romans 12 too, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? You take the word of God and you put it up against thoughts that are exalting itself against the knowledge of God and you bring whatever thinking you had up under subjection to what God is saying in his word. That's how you break the stronghold. That's how you break out of the prison of thinking in a dark way. That's how you bring the thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Because hear me when I say this, your thoughts, this is going to trip you out. Your thoughts are alive. Your thoughts are alive. They're, they're, they're living entities. 
I know that doesn't sound like it's real spiritual or, or Christian, but it is. Your thoughts. For a man, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, you become what you think because your thoughts are alive. Your thoughts create life. Your thoughts create whatever it is that is existing in your life. You become the sum total of your thoughts. It's not just what you feel, it's what you're thinking. And the devil knows this. If you think you're going to lose, you're going to lose. If you think you're a failure, failure begins to materialize in your life. Because you came into agreement with it in your mind, in your thoughts. Does that make sense? That's why, again, my brothers and sisters, we have to protect our minds, our minds, our thinking, so that you can keep your spirit and your heart free and live the life that God has for you. But you've got to bring those thoughts into captivity. You've got to bring them into captivity. No, this is not going to happen to me. And I bring it into captivity to what the word says. I am more than a conqueror through him that loved us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If God be for us, then who can be against us? Do you see what I'm saying? You see how that will just shut down what, what other thoughts are trying to penetrate your spirit and your belief system? But you, you have to ward, you have to fight thoughts. God, thank you, Holy Spirit. You have to fight thoughts with thoughts. You have to fight word with word. You have to fight doctrine with doctrine. You have to fight lies with truth. Do you hear what I'm saying? And, and, and the truth as it comes, if you lean on it, it will crush the lie. If you cleave to it, it will break the stronghold and all of a sudden more light and revelation and spiritual enlightenment will, become to, will begin to arise in your soul and in your spirit and you'll feel like yourself again. You'll feel like you're walking with God again and that, that stronghold, that prison you were in mentally is being broken, it's being torn down, it's being crushed by the power of God. Oh, I love what Paul says, and bringing into captivity the obedience of Christ, bringing it into captivity, every thought. Notice he didn't say every person. He didn't even say the devil. He said every thought to the obedience of Christ. Because again, the fight is where? It's in your mind. It's in what you're thinking. It's in your emotional realm. It's in your thought process, your thought life. And, and Paul is saying, bring those thoughts into captivity. Arrest them. Put, put chains on them. Put handcuffs on them. Lock them away. That's what he's talking about. Literally lock them away, but spiritually take God's word and bring it down and cast it out of your emotions and out of your spirit. See, revelation alone would just push it out of you. That's how powerful revelation is. Revelation is. Get the revelation of what God is saying. Let that feed you and it will automatically push out of you those other thoughts. See, see, if you want to get rid of darkness, all you have to do is turn the lights on. You notice that? You don't even have to fight and wrestle with the darkness. Just turn the lights on. You walk in a room and the lights are not on and it's dark and you're fighting the dark? You're fighting this and you're fighting that and you're wrestling and you're using energy and strength when all you have to do is turn the lights on. The moment you turn the light switch on, the darkness leaves. Immediately. You don't have to rebuke it. 
You don't have to bring it under subjection. All you need is more revelation of his word. And the more revelation of his word that you begin to receive into your spirit, those false thoughts, those, those strongholds begin to dissipate and you begin to walk in the light and the glory of God. And this is what Paul is shining the light on, that first of all, Corinthian church, you have been deceived by false apostles. And one of the ways that they're trying to deceive you, too, is to cause you to think something contrary about my character that isn't true. <laughs> He's got to straighten that out, too. And, and, uh, and, and see, and that's the thing that the enemy wants to di di disconnect them from their leader. Do you see what I'm saying? He wants to disconnect them from their leader because Paul has revelation. Did you hear what I just said? Paul has revelation. We know Paul had revelation. Don't fight me on that. I'll prove it. We know Paul had revelation. Paul came late as an apostle. He was not one of the original 12. And yet Paul had more revelation about Jesus and the kingdom and spiritual things than any of the apostles that actually walked with him and talked with him and ate fish with him and sat down at the Lord's Supper. Paul didn't experience any of that. But it's Paul that said in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that we shall all be caught up to meet him in the air. How do you know? He's got revelation. He's got revelation. It is Paul who says eyes have not seen and ears have not heard and neither have entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. How do you know that? That we'll walk in things that our eyes have not seen and our ears have not heard and have not even entered into a heart. How do you know Paul? He knows by revelation. How do you know that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord? How do you know Paul? He's got revelation. The light has come on. The Holy Spirit is downloading mysteries of the kingdom unto the Apostle Paul. How do you know that the dead in Christ shall rise first? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know that all things shall work together for the good of them who love the Lord and for those who are the call according to his purpose? We didn't see that in the old covenant. Moses never said that. Jonah never said that. Joshua never said that. Not even Elijah ever spoke these sort of things. But Paul was in the mind of God. Paul was hearing the very heart of God. Oh my God, y'all better hear me. No wonder the enemy tried to turn them against him because Paul gave us two-thirds of the New Testament scriptures. Why wasn't it Peter? And Peter was the chief apostle. Because just because you're the chief apostle doesn't mean you have revelation. Deeper revelation. We know Peter had some revelation. What I'm trying to say is Paul had deeper. Paul could speak about things that none of the other apostles could ever speak about. And many of them, we don't, we don't hear much about their lives at all. There's not much about Thomas. We don't know much about Matthew. Are you listening to me? We know that Luke was a physician. There's not much said about them in Scripture. I know that there's a book of Thomas, but it didn't fit the canon of Scripture, so we don't really know. There are some things about the disciples that we don't know about who actually walked with Jesus, and yet Paul comes late in the game. And you only hear Paul saying, oh, that I may know him. <laughs> in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering. You don't hear any of the other apostles talking this way. And all of a sudden, God is revealing these divine truths unto him. And the devil is trying to come in and steal their revelation. And steal their relationship with their true apostle. This is what's going on. This is the warfare. This is the stage. And Paul is saying, get the devil out of your mind. <laughs> Stop letting people and voices control how you think. 
Stop falling for the tricks of the enemy. I was just talking about relationships on Sunday. The devil hates divine relationships. Stop listening to lies about people that God has ordained to be in your life. He's trying to show them the enemy has gotten in your mind with these teachings. Don't you know who Jesus is? Don't you realize that he's the rock? That he's the foundation? That's why you see in another portion of scripture as he writes to the Corinthians, he says, no other foundation can no man lay other than that which has been laid, which is Jesus Christ. Because they were trying to, these false apostles and doctrines were trying to change the foundation. They were trying to detour them and to get them to believe in other things that were not grounded in truth. As it was back then, years and years ago, so it is right now. Because there are all kinds of doctrines and teachings and philosophies and somebody saying this and somebody saying that. And you've got to guard your mind. You've got to protect your thinking. That's why later in Galatians, Paul says to the Galatian church, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched? He said, who has worked a spell on you? You don't even sound like you're my disciples. That's what he's saying. Who, who's, who have you been listening to? Who's, got, who's in your head? Oh, foolish Galatians, mm -hmm. who has bewitched you? Who, who has come along and changed what I taught you? Shifted your consciousness into false beliefs. These are the dynamics of warfare. And God is saying, I need you to put on the whole armor, protect yourself. Use the weapons that God has given to you that you might stay in the fight. Will you stand to your feet? Glory to God. Hallelujah. I pray that this is helping somebody tonight, that this is strengthening your heart and your spirit and bringing you to a place of greater commitment to, to walk in his divine protection. And that you will not allow other voices to penetrate your soul to lead you astray. Glory to God. Let's pray. Father, we come humbly before you and before your throne. And we thank you for this word tonight. We thank you that you see our every need. That you know our struggles. That you know what we're facing. You understand the warfare that we're up against. It's not a physical fight. It's a spiritual fight. It's not, it's not, it's not abstract. It's, 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 it's not concrete, but it's abstract. It's not, it's not something tangible. It's intangible. It's not something visible. It's invisible. And I pray tonight that you will arrest our hearts, that we might understand how to engage in spiritual warfare and get the victory and walk in the light of your word to be illuminated through the spirit of revelation and spiritual enlightenment. Give us the gift of revelation that we might continue to walk in your truth and give us the grace, O oh God, to bring down every stronghold and every thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and help us to bring it into obedience to Christ that, Father, you might be glorified. Touch us tonight in a special way. Let this word stir us up in our faith, in our understanding, that we might be stronger and that we might walk over and defeat the powers of darkness. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Warfare. That's the word of the Lord tonight. Listen, we've got to let you go. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for those that are here present with us tonight. The Lord's about to do something that your eyes have not seen and your ears have not heard. And maybe you're here tonight to receive this word to confirm to you that the enemy knows that you're close. And that's why you have come up under attack. But greater is he that is in you 
than he that is in the world. We love you. God bless you. We'll see you next time.